Tipu Sultan, born Sultan Fateh Ali Sahab Tipu, the 20th of November 1750 to the 4th of May 1799, also known as the Tipu Sahib, was a ruler of the Kingdom of Mysore. He was the eldest son of Sultan Hyder Ali of Mysore. Tipu Sultan introduced a number of administrative innovations during his rule, including his coinage, a new Mauludi lunisolar calendar, and a new land revenue system which initiated the growth of the Mysore silk industry. He expanded the iron-cased Mysorean rockets and commissioned the military manual Fathal Mujahidin, and is considered a pioneer in the use of rocket artillery. He deployed the rockets against advances of British forces and their allies during the Anglo-Mysore Wars, including the Battle of Palalar and Siege of Seringapatam. He also embarked on an ambitious economic development program that established Mysore as a major economic power, with some of the world's highest real wages and living standards in the late 18th century. Napoleon Bonaparte, the French commander in chief, sought an alliance with Tipu Sultan. Both Tipu Sultan and his father used their French trained army in alliance with the French in their struggle with the British, and in Mysore's struggles with other surrounding powers, against the Marathas, Sira, and rulers of Malabar, Kodagu, Bednor, Carnatic, and Travancore. Tipu's father, Hyder Ali, rose to power capturing Mysore, and Tipu succeeded Mysore upon his father's death in 1782. He won important victories against the British in the Second Anglo-Mysore War and negotiated the 1784 Treaty of Mangalore with them after his father died from cancer in December 1782 during the Second Anglo-Mysore War. Tipu's conflicts with his neighbours included the Maratha-Mysore War which ended with the signing the Treaty of Gajendragad The treaty required that Tipu Sultan pay 4.8 million rupees as a one-time war cost to the Marathas, and an annual tribute of 1.2 million rupees in addition to returning all the territory captured by Hyder Ali. Tipu remained an implacable enemy of the British East India Company, sparking conflict with his attack on British-allied Travancore in 1789. In the Third Anglo-Mysore War, he was forced into the Treaty of Seringapatam, losing a number of previously conquered territories, including Malabar and Mangalore. He sent emissaries to foreign states, including the Ottoman Empire, Afghanistan, and France, in an attempt to rally opposition to the British. In the Fourth Anglo-Mysore War, the imperial forces of the British East India Company were supported by the Nizam of Hyderabad. They defeated Tipu, and he was killed on 4 May 1799 while defending his fort of Srirangapatna. He was one of the few South Indian kings to provide stiff resistance to British imperialism, along with Hyder Ali. He is applauded as a ruler who fought against British colonialism. Tipu has been a controversial figure and criticized for his repression of Hindus and Christians. Various sources describe the massacres, imprisonment, forced conversion and circumcision of Hindus Kodavas of Korg and Nairs of Malabar and Christians Catholics of Mangalore and the destruction of churches and temples which are cited as evidence for his religious intolerance. Other sources mention the appointment of Hindu officers in his administration and his endowments to Hindu temples which are cited as evidence for his religious tolerance. Early years Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Childhood Tipu Sultan was born on the 20th of November 1750, Friday, 20th Du Al Hicha, 1163 AH at Devanahalli in present-day Bangalore rural district, about 33 kilometers 21 miles north of Bangalore city. He was named Tipu Sultan, after the Saint Tipu Mastan Aulia of Arcot. Being illiterate, Hyder was very particular in giving his eldest son a prince's education and a very early exposure to military and political affairs. From the age of 17 Tipu was given independent charge of important diplomatic and military missions. He was his father's right arm in the wars from which Hyder emerged as the most powerful ruler of southern India. Tipu's father, Hyder Ali, was a military officer in service to the Kingdom of Mysore who had become the de facto ruler of Mysore in 1761 while his mother Fatima Fakur un Nisa was the daughter of Mir Muin Ud Din, the governor of the fort of Kadapa. Hyder Ali appointed able teachers to give Tipu an early education in subjects like Urdu, Persian, Arabic, Kannada, Quran, Islamic jurisprudence, writing, shooting and fencing. <laughs> early military service 
Tipu Sultan was instructed in military tactics by French officers in the employment of his father. At age 15, he accompanied his father against the British in the First Mysore War in 1766. He commanded a corps of cavalry in the invasion of Carnatic in 1767 at age 16. He also distinguished himself in the First Anglo Maratha War of 1775 1779. Alexander Beetson, who published a volume on the Fourth Mysore War entitled View of the Origin and Conduct of the War with Tipu Sultan, described Tipu Sultan as follows. His stature was about 5 feet 8 inches, he had a short neck, square shoulders, and was rather corpulent, his limbs were small, particularly his feet and hands, he had large full eyes, small arched eyebrows, and an aquiline nose, his complexion was fair, and the general expression of his countenance, not void of dignity. Second Anglo-Mysore War In 1779, the British captured the French-controlled port of Mahé, which Tipu had placed under his protection, providing some troops for its defence. In response, Hyder launched an invasion of the Carnatic, with the aim of driving the British out of Madras. During this campaign in September 1780, Tipu Sultan was dispatched by Hyder Ali with 10,000 men and 18 guns to intercept Colonel Bailey who was on his way to join Sir Hector Munro. In the Battle of Palalar, Tipu decisively defeated Bailey. Out of 360 Europeans, about 200 were captured alive, and the sepoys, who were about 3,800 men, suffered very high casualties. Monroe was moving south with a separate force to join Bailey, but on hearing the news of the defeat he was forced to retreat to Madras, abandoning his artillery in a water tank at Kanchipuram. Tipu Sultan defeated Colonel Braithwaite at Anagudi near Tanjore on 18 February 1782. Braithwaite's forces, consisting of 100 Europeans, 300 cavalry, 1400 sepoys and 10 field pieces, was the standard size of the colonial armies. Tipu Sultan seized all the guns and took the entire detachment prisoner. In December 1781 Tipu Sultan successfully seized Chitor from the British. Tipu Sultan had thus gained sufficient military experience by the time Hyder Ali died on Friday 6 December 1782 some historians put it at two or three days later or before, Hijri date being 1 Muharram, 1197 as per some records in Persian, there may be a difference of one to three days due to the lunar calendar. Tipu Sultan realized that the British were a new kind of threat in India. He became the ruler of Mysore on Sunday, the 22nd of December, 1782. The inscriptions in some of Tipu's regalia showing it as 20 Muharram, 1197 Hijri, Sunday, in a simple coronation ceremony. He then worked on to check the advances of the British by making alliances with the Marathas and the Mughals. The Second Mysore War came to an end with the 1784 Treaty of Mangalore. Topic. Tanjore abductions The war is also noted for excesses committed by Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan in Tanjore. During the period of occupation, which lasted six months, Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan are believed to have impoverished the country, destroying crops and cattle. As late as 1785, the Dutch missionary Christian Friedrich Schwartz describes Tipu's alleged abduction of 12,000 children from the region. The economic output of Tanjore is estimated to have fallen by 90% between 1770 and 1782. The ravages of Hyder and Tipu were followed by alleged expeditions of plunder launched by the Kalars. The economic devastation wrought by these attacks was so severe that Tanjore's economy did not recover until the start of the 19th century. The era is referred to in local folklore as the Hyder Akalaban. Topic. Ruler of the Mysore state In 1780, Tipu crowned himself Badshah or Emperor of Mysore, and struck coinage. Topic. Conflicts with Maratha Confederacy The Maratha Empire, under its new Peshwa Madhav Rao I, regained most of Indian subcontinent, twice defeating Tipu's father, who was forced to accept Maratha Empire as the supreme power in 1764 and then in 1767. 
In 1767 Maratha Peshwa Madhavrao defeated both Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan and entered Srirangapatna, the capital of Mysore. Hyder Ali accepted the authority of Madhavrao who gave him the title of Nawab of Mysore, however Tipu Sultan wanted to escape from the Treaty of Marathas and therefore tried to take some Maratha forts in southern India, which were captured by Marathas in the previous war. Tipu also stopped the tribute to Marathas which was promised by Hyder Ali. This brought Tipu in direct conflict with the Marathas, leading to Maratha-Mysore War Conflicts between Mysore under Tipu and Marathas Siege of Nargand during February 1785 won by Mysore Siege of Badami during May 1786 in which Mysore surrendered Siege of Adoni during June 1786 won by Mysore Battle of Gajendragad, June 1786 won by Marathas Battle of Savanore during October 1786 won by Mysore Siege of Bahadur Benda during January 1787 won by Mysore conflict ended with Treaty of Gajendragad in March 1787 as per which Tipu returned all the territory captured by Hyder Ali to Maratha Empire Tipu agreed to pay 4 year arrears of tribute which his father Hyder Ali had agreed to pay to Maratha Empire 4.8 million rupees the Marathas agreed to address Tipu Sultan as Nabob Tipu Sultan Fada Ali Khan The invasion of Malabar by Sultanate of Mysore (1766–1790). In 1766, when Tipu Sultan was just 15 years old, he got the chance to apply his military training in battle for the first time, when he accompanied his father on an invasion of Malabar. After the incident siege of Telicheri in Thalassery in North Malabar, Hyder Ali started losing his territories in Malabar. Tipu came from Mysore to reinstate the authority over Malabar. After the Battle of the Nedumkota (1789–90), due to the monsoon flood, the stiff resistance of the Travancore forces, and news about the attack of British in Srirangapatnam, he went back. Topic: <laughs> Third Anglo-Mysore War. In 1789, Tipu Sultan disputed the acquisition by Dharma Raja of Travancore of two Dutch-held fortresses in Cochin. In December 1789 he massed troops at Coimbatore, and on 28 December made an attack on the lines of Travancore, knowing that Travancore was, according to the Treaty of Mangalore, an ally of the British East India Company. On account of the staunch resistance by the Travancore army, Tipu was unable to break through the Travancore lines and the Maharaja of Travancore appealed to the East India Company for help. In response, Lord Cornwallis mobilised company and British military forces, and formed alliances with the Marathas and the Nizam of Hyderabad to oppose Tipu. In 1790 the company forces advanced, taking control of much of the Coimbatore district. Tipu counter-attacked, regaining much of the territory, although the British continued to hold Coimbatore itself. He then descended into the Carnatic, eventually reaching Pondicherry, where he attempted without success to draw the French into the conflict. In 1791 his opponents advanced on all fronts, with the main British force under Cornwallis taking Bangalore and threatening Srirangapatna. Tipu harassed the British supply and communication and embarked on a scorched earth policy of denying local resources to the invaders. In this last effort he was successful, as the lack of provisions forced Cornwallis to withdraw to Bangalore rather than attempt a siege of Srirangapatna. Following the withdrawal, Tipu sent forces to Coimbatore, which they retook after a lengthy siege. The 1792 campaign was a failure for Tipu. The Allied army was well supplied, and Tipu was unable to prevent the junction of forces from Bangalore and Bombay before Srirangapatna. After about two weeks of siege, Tipu opened negotiations for terms of surrender. In the ensuing treaty, he was forced to cede half his territories to the Allies, and deliver two of his sons as hostages until he paid in full three crores and thirty lakhs rupees fixed as war indemnity to the British for the campaign against him. He paid the amount in two installments and got back his sons from Madras. Napoleon's attempt at a junction 
In 1794, with the support of French Republican officers, Tipu helped found the Jacobin Club of Mysore for framing laws comfortable with the laws of the Republic. He planted a liberty tree and declared himself citizen Tipu. One of the motivations of Napoleon's invasion of Egypt was to establish a junction with India against the British. Bonaparte wished to establish a French presence in the Middle East, with the ultimate dream of linking with Tipu Sahib. Napoleon assured the French Directory that, as soon as he had conquered Egypt, he will establish relations with the Indian princes and, together with them, attack the English in their possessions. According to a 13 February 1798 report by Talleyrand, "...having occupied and fortified Egypt, we shall send a force of 15,000 men from Suez to India, to join the forces of Tipu Sahib and drive away the English." Napoleon was unsuccessful in this strategy, losing the Siege of Acre in 1799 and at the Battle of Abukir in 1801. Death Topic <inaudible> Fourth Anglo Mysore War Horatio Nelson defeated Francois Paul Bruys Daigaliers at the Battle of the Nile in Egypt in 1798. Three armies marched into Mysore in 1799 one from Bombay and two British, one of which included Arthur Wellesley. They besieged the capital Srirangapatna in the Fourth Mysore War. There were more than 26,000 soldiers of the British East India Company, approximately 4,000 Europeans and the rest Indians. A column was supplied by the Nizam of Hyderabad consisting of 10 battalions and more than 16,000 cavalry, and many soldiers were sent by the Marathas. Thus, the soldiers in the British force numbered more than 50,000, whereas Tipu Sultan had only about 30,000. The British broke through the city walls, and French military advisers told Tipu Sultan to escape via secret passages, but he replied, Better to live one day as a tiger than a thousand years as a sheep. Tipu Sultan died defending his capital on 4 May Tipu Sultan was killed at the Holy Didi Gateway, which was located 300 yards 270 meters from the N.E. Angle of the Srirangapatna Fort. He was buried the next afternoon at the Gumas, next to the grave of his father. Many members of the British East India Company believed that Nawab of Karnatak Umdat ul Umra secretly provided assistance to Tipu Sultan during the war and sought his deposition after 1799. Administration Tipu introduced a new calendar, new coinage, and seven new government departments, during his reign, and made military innovations in the use of rocketry. Mysorean rockets Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, the former President of India, in his Tipu Sultan Shaheed Memorial Lecture in Bangalore the 30th of November 1991, called Tipu Sultan the innovator of the world's first war rocket. Two of these rockets, captured by the British at Srirangapatna, were displayed in the Royal Artillery Museum in London. According to historian Dr. Dalari Qureshi Tipu Sultan was a fierce warrior king and was so quick in his movement that it seemed to the enemy that he was fighting on many fronts at the same time. Tipu managed to subdue all the petty kingdoms in the south. He defeated the Nizams and was also one of the few Indian rulers to have defeated British armies. He is said to have started a new coinage, calendar, and a new system of weights and measures mainly based on the methods introduced by French technicians. Tipu Sultan's father had expanded on Mysore's use of rocketry, making critical innovations in the rockets themselves and the military logistics of their use. He deployed as many as 1,200 specialized troops in his army to operate rocket launchers. These men were skilled in operating the weapons and were trained to launch their rockets at an angle calculated from the diameter of the cylinder and the distance to the target. The rockets had twin side sharpened blades mounted on them, and when fired en masse, spun and wreaked significant damage against a large army. Tipu greatly expanded the use of rockets after Hyder's death, deploying as many as 5,000 rocketeers at a time. 
The rockets deployed by Tipu during the Battle of Palalar were much more advanced than those the British East India Company had previously seen, chiefly because of the use of iron tubes for holding the propellant. This enabled higher thrust and longer range for the missiles up to 2 km range. British accounts describe the use of the rockets during the Third and Fourth Wars. During the climactic battle at Srirangapatna in 1799, British shells struck a magazine containing rockets, causing it to explode and send a towering cloud of black smoke with cascades of exploding white light rising up from the battlements. After Tipu's defeat in the Fourth War the British captured a number of the Mysorean rockets. These became influential in British rocket development, inspiring the Congreve rocket, which was soon put into use in the Napoleonic Wars. Navy In 1786 Tipu Sultan, again following the lead of his father, decided to build a navy consisting of 20 battleships of 72 cannons and 20 frigates of 62 cannons. In the year 1790 he appointed Kamaluddin as his Mir Bihar and established massive dockyards at Jamalabad and Mahidabad. Tipu Sultan's board of admiralty consisted of 11 commanders in service of Amir Yam. Amir Yam led 30 admirals and each one of them had two ships. By the year 1789 most of Tipu Sultan's ships had copper bottoms, an idea that increased the longevity of the ships and was introduced to Tipu by Admiral Suffren. <laughs> <laughs> economy The peak of Mysore's economic power was under Tipu Sultan in the late 18th century. Along with his father Hyder Ali, he embarked on an ambitious program of economic development, aiming increase the wealth and revenue of Mysore. Under his reign, Mysore overtook Bengal Subha as India's dominant economic power, with highly productive agriculture and textile manufacturing. Mysore's average income was five times higher than subsistence level at the time. The Mysore silk industry was first initiated during the reign of Tipu Sultan. He sent an expert to Bengal Subha to study silk cultivation and processing, after which Mysore began developing polyvoltine silk. Under Tipu Sultan, Mysore had some of the world's highest real wages and living standards in the late 18th century, higher than Britain, which in turn had the highest living standards in Europe. Mysore's average per capita income was five times higher than subsistence level, i.e. five times higher than $400 1990 international dollars, or $2,000 per capita. In comparison, the highest national per capita incomes in 1820 were $1,838 for the Netherlands and $1,706 for Britain. Religious policy On a personal level, Tipu was a devout Muslim, saying his prayers daily and paying special attention to mosques in the area. As a Muslim ruler of a predominantly Hindu country, some of his policies have evoked controversy. The mainstream view considers Tipu's administration to have been tolerant. Regular endowments were made during this period to about 156 Hindu temples, including the famed Ranganathaswamy Temple at Srirangapatna. His religious legacy has become a source of considerable controversy in India, with some groups proclaiming him a great warrior for the faith or Ghazi, while others revile him as a bigot who massacred Hindus, Christians. He clamped down on several communities such as the Hindus of Korg, the Christians of Mangalore, the Nayars of Malabar, the Mapilla Muslims of Malabar, the Mahadevi Muslims, and the Muslim. Nawabs of Sawanur and Nizam for both religious and political reasons. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> British accounts. Historians such as Brittlebank, Hassan, Chetty, Habib, and Salatair, amongst others, argue that controversial stories of Tipu Sultan's religious persecution of Hindus and Christians are largely derived from the work of early British authors who were very much against Tipu Sultan's independence and harbored prejudice against the Sultan such as Kirkpatrick and Mark Wilkes, whom they do not consider to be entirely reliable and likely fabricated. A. S. Chetty argues that Wilkes' account in particular cannot be trusted. Irfan Habib and Mohibul Hassan argue that these early British authors had a strong vested interest in presenting Tipu Sultan as a tyrant from whom the British had liberated Mysore. 
This assessment is echoed by Brittlebank in her recent work where she writes that Wilkes and Kirkpatrick must be used with particular care as both authors had taken part in the wars against Tipu Sultan and were closely connected to the administrations of Lord Cornwallis and Richard Wellesley, first Marquis Wellesley. However, such arguments are dubious because even contemporary French sources mentions about cruelties of Tipu Sultan. The French were allies of Tipu Sultan. François Fidel Ripoud de Montedevert, a French soldier who fought for Tipu, in his diary entry of January 14, 1799 writes, I'm disturbed by Tipu Sultan's treatment of these most gentle souls, the Hindus. During the siege of Mangalore, Tipu's soldiers daily exposed the heads of many innocent Brahmins within sight from the fort for the Zamoran and his Hindu followers to see. <laughs> Foreign relations. Mughal Empire Both Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan owed nominal allegiance to the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II. But unlike the Nawab of Karnatak, they did not acknowledge the overlordship of the Nizam of Hyderabad. Immediately after his coronation, Tipu Sultan sought the investiture of the Mughal Emperor. Nizam Ali Khan, the Nizam of Hyderabad, clearly expressed his hostility by dissuading the Mughal Emperor and laying claims on Mysore. Disheartened, Tipu Sultan began to establish contacts with other Muslim rulers of that period. After the eunuch Ghulam Qadir had Shah Alam II blinded on 10 August 1788, Tipu Sultan is believed to have broken into tears. After facing substantial threats from the Marathas, Tipu Sultan began to correspond with Zaman Shah Durrani, the ruler of the Afghan Durrani Empire, so they could defeat the British and Marathas. Initially, Zaman Shah agreed to help Tipu, but the Persian attack on Afghanistan's western border diverted its forces, and hence no help could be provided to Tipu. Ottoman Turkey in 1787, Tipu Sultan sent an embassy to the Ottoman capital Istanbul, to the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid I requesting urgent assistance against the British East India Company and proposing an offensive and defensive consortium. Tipu Sultan requested the Ottoman Sultan to send him troops and military experts. Furthermore, Tipu Sultan also requested permission from the Ottomans to contribute to the maintenance of the Islamic shrines in Mecca, Medina, Najaf and Karbala. However, the Ottomans were themselves in crisis and still recuperating from the devastating Austro-Ottoman War and a new conflict with the Russian Empire had begun, for which Ottoman Turkey needed British alliance to keep off the Russians, hence it could not risk being hostile to the British in the Indian theatre. Due to the Ottoman inability to organize a fleet in the Indian Ocean, Tipu Sultan's ambassadors returned home only with gifts from their Ottoman allies. Nevertheless, Tipu Sultan's correspondence with the Ottoman Turkish Empire and particularly its new Sultan Selim III continued till his final battle in the year 1799. Persia like his father before him, Tipu Sultan maintained friendly relations with Muhammad Ali Khan, ruler of the Zand dynasty in Persia. Tipu Sultan also maintained correspondence with Hamid bin Said, the ruler of the Sultanate of Oman. Franceboth Hyder Ali and Tipu sought an alliance with the French, the only European power still strong enough to challenge the British East India Company in the subcontinent. In 1782, Louis XVI concluded an alliance with the Peshwa Madhu Rao Narayan. This treaty enabled Bussy to move his troops to the Isle de France now Mauritius. In the same year, French Admiral de Suffren ceremonially presented a portrait of Louis XVI to Haydar Ali and sought his alliance. Napoleon conquered Egypt in an attempt to link with Tipu Sultan. In February 1798, Napoleon wrote a letter to Tipu Sultan appreciating his efforts of resisting the British annexation and plans, but this letter never reached Tipu and was seized by a British spy in Muscat. The idea of a possible Tipu Napoleon alliance alarmed the British governor, General Sir Richard Wellesley, also known as Lord Wellesley, so much that he immediately started large scale preparations for a final battle against Tipu Sultan. <laughs> Relations with Muslims During his campaigns of clamping down on groups that helped the British, Tipu Sultan targeted several Muslim groups, including the Mapilla Muslims of Malabar, the Mahadevi Muslims, and the Nawab of Savanur and Nizam. <laughs> Relations with Hindus <laughs> Hindu officers 
Tipu Sultan's treasurer was Krishna Rao, Shamaya Iyengar was his minister of post and police, his brother Ranga Iyengar was also an officer, and Purnaya held the very important post of Mir Asaf. Mulchand and Sujan Rai were his chief agents at the Mughal court, and his chief, Peshkar Suba Rao, was also a Hindu. Regular endowments to 156 Hindu temples Editor of Mysore Gazette's spondence between his court and temples, and his having donated jewellery and deeded land grants to several temples, which he was compelled to do to make alliances with Hindu rulers. Between 1782 and 1799 Tipu Sultan issued 34 sanads. Deeds of endowment to temples in his domain, while also presenting many of them with gifts of silver and gold plate. The Srikantaswara temple in Nanjangud still possesses a jeweled cup presented by the Sultan. He also gave a greenish linga. To Ranganatha temple at Srirangapatna, he donated seven silver cups and a silver camphor burner. This temple was hardly a stone's throw from his palace from where he would listen with equal respect to the ringing of temple bells and the musan's call from the mosque. To the Lakshmikanta temple at Kalale he gifted four cups, a plate and spittoon in silver. <laughs> Shringari incident, Maratha sacking, and rebuilding temple During the Maratha Mysore War in 1791, a group of Maratha horsemen under Righunath Rao Patwardhan raided the temple and matha of Sringeri Shankaracharya. They killed and wounded many people, including Brahmins, plundered the monastery of all its valuable possessions, and desecrated the temple by displacing the image of Goddess Sarada. The incumbent Shankaracharya petitioned Tipu Sultan for help. A bunch of about 30 letters written in Kannada, which were exchanged between Tipu Sultan's court and the Sringeri Shankaracharya were discovered in 1916 by the director of archaeology in Mysore. Tipu Sultan expressed his indignation and grief at the news of the raid. People who have sinned against such a holy place are sure to suffer the consequences of their misdeeds at no distant date in this Kali age in accordance with the verse. Hasadba Kriyate Karma Rudadbur Anubuyat People do evil deeds smilingly but suffer the consequences crying. He immediately ordered the Asaf of Bednar to supply the Swami with 200 rahatis phanams in cash and other gifts and articles. Tipu Sultan's interest in the Sringeri temple continued for many years, and he was still writing to the Swami in the 1790s. Topic. Controversial figure. In light of this and other events, historian B. A. Salatare has described Tipu Sultan as a defender of the Hindu Dharma, who also patronized other temples including one at Melkote, for which he issued a Kannada decree that the Srivaishnava invocatory verses there should be recited in the traditional form. The temple at Melkote still has gold and silver vessels with inscriptions indicating that they were presented by the Sultan. Tipu Sultan also presented four silver cups to the Lakshmikanda temple at Kalale. Tipu Sultan does seem to have repossessed unauthorized grants of land made to Brahmins and temples, but those which had proper sanads certificates were not. It was a normal practice for any ruler, Muslim or Hindu, on his accession or on the conquest of new territory. Noted for his persecution of Christians, historian Thomas Paul notes that Tipu had shifted his hatred for the British to Catholics of Mangalore and other Christian communities of South India. According to historian Praxi Fernandez, Tipu Sultan was an enlightened monarch who followed a secular policy towards his subjects. See, Hayavajana Rao wrote about Tipu in his Encyclopedic Court History of Mysore. He asserted that Tipu's religious fanaticism and the excesses committed in the name of religion, both in Mysore and in the provinces, stand condemned for all time. His bigotry, indeed, was so great that it precluded all ideas of toleration." He further asserts that the acts of Tipu that were constructive towards Hindus were largely political and ostentatious rather than an indication of genuine tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> Treatment of Lingayats After Haider Ali led a coup, after being appointed the military chief of Hindu Wadiar dynasty of Mysore, the Lingayats of Karnataka came under Islamic rule in the late 18th century. During this period, the followers of Lingayatism were persecuted. 
A British source claimed that Tipu Sultan found the practice of Lingayat women of being topless, offensive and ordered the mutilation of breasts of a Lingayat woman. As a result, wearing of long garments came into use by Hindu women. Treatment of Hindus outside Mysore Kodagu Korg. The battles between Kodavas and Tipu Sultan is one of the most bitter rivalries in South India. There were repeated attempts to capture Kodagu by the Sultan and his father Hyder Ali before him. The primary reason for Sultan's interest in Kodagu was that annexing Kodagu would provide access to Mangalore port. The Kodavas knew their lands and mountains very well which made them excellent at guerrilla warfare. Kodavas were outnumbered 3 to 1 in most of Tipu's attempts to annex Kodagu but they managed to beat back Tipu most of the times by drawing his army towards hilly regions of their land. On few occasions Tipu's army managed to reach Matakiri capital of Kodagu but the Kodavas always ambushed the contingent left behind by Tipu. Kodava's refusal to bow to the Sultan was primarily because throughout their history they enjoyed independence, though there were Rajas ruling over them, governance of the land mainly rested with Kodavas. After capturing Kodagu on another occasion, Tipu proclaimed, If you ever dare to ambush my men again, I will honor every one of you with Islam. Undeterred, the resilient Kodavas ambushed his men yet again and drove them back to Mysore. By now Tipu realized conventional warfare would never yield him Kodagu. He devised a plan to annex Kodagu by offering his friendship. His offer of friendship was welcomed by Kodavas as the battles with the Sultan over the years had cost them dearly. When Kodavas welcomed Sultan to their land in the name of friendship, the Sultan and his men attacked them and took thousands as prisoners. Tipu got Runmust Khan, the Nawab of Kurnool, to launch a surprise attack upon the Kodava Hindus who were besieged by the invading Muslim army. 500 were killed and over 40,000 Kodavas fled to the woods and concealed themselves in the mountains. Thousands of Kodavas were seized along with the Raja and held captive at Seringapatam. They were thought to be subjected to forcible conversions to Islam, death, and torture. In Seringapatam, the young men were all forcibly circumcised and incorporated into the Ahmadi Corps, and were formed into eight Rizalas or regiments. The actual number of Kodavas that were captured in the operation is unclear. The British administrator Mark Wilkes gives it as 70,000, historian Lewis Rice arrives at the figure of 85,000, while Mir Kermani's score for the Korg campaign is 80,000 men, women and child prisoners. Mohibul Hassan, Prof. Sheikh Ali, and other historians cast great doubt on the scale of the deportations and forced conversions in Korg in particular. Hassan says that it is difficult to estimate the real number of Koorgis captured by Tipu. In a letter to Runmost Khan, Tipu himself stated, We proceeded with the utmost speed, and, at once, made prisoners of 40,000 occasion seeking and sedition exciting Koorgis, who alarmed at the approach of our victorious army, had slunk into woods, and concealed themselves in lofty mountains, inaccessible even to birds then carrying them away from their native country the native place of sedition we raised them to the honor of islam and incorporated them into our ahmadi corps kasaragod near mangalore tipu sent a letter on the 19th of january 1790 to the governor of bekal near kasaragod budras zuman khan it says don't you know i have achieved a great victory recently in malabar and over 4 lakh hindus were converted to islam I am determined to march against that cursed Raman Nair Raja of Travancore very soon. Since I am overjoyed at the prospect of converting him and his subjects to Islam, I have happily abandoned the idea of going back to Srirangapatnam now. Malabar North Malabar in 1788, Tipu entered into Malabar to quell a rebellion. Nairs were surrounded with offers of death or circumcision. Chirakal's Nair Raja who was received with distinctions for surrendering voluntarily was later hanged. Tipu then divided Malabar into districts, with three officers in each district given the task of numbering productive trees, collecting revenue and giving religious orders to Nairs. Calicut Kori Code in 1788, Tipu ordered his governor in Calicut Sher Khan to begin the process of converting Hindus to Islam, and in July of that year, 200 Brahmins were forcibly converted. Destruction of the palace at Vitala. In 1784, Tipu Sultan captured Achutha Hegade, king of Vitala. He beheaded him and set fire to the ancient royal palace of the Domba Hegade kings of Vitala. 
It was an ancient and sacred palace of the dynasty whose age goes back to the period when the first kings settled in that area. Topic: <inaudible> Inscriptions. On the handle of the sword presented by Tipu to Marquis Wellesley was the following inscription: My victorious saber is lightning for the destruction of the unbelievers. Ali, the Emir of the Faithful, is victorious for my advantage, and moreover, he destroyed the wicked race who were unbelievers. Praise be to him, God, who is the Lord of the worlds. Thou art our Lord, support us against the people who are unbelievers. He to whom the Lord giveth victory prevails over all mankind. O Lord, make him victorious, who promoteth the faith of Muhammad. Confound him, who refuseth the faith of Muhammad, and withhold us from those who are so inclined from the true faith. The Lord is predominant over his own works. Victory and conquest are from the Almighty. Bring happy tidings, O Muhammad, to the faithful, for God is the kind protector and is the most merciful of the merciful. If God assists thee, thou wilt prosper. May the Lord God assist thee, O Muhammad, with a mighty great victory. During a search of his palace in 1795, some gold medals were found in the palace, on which the following was inscribed on one side in Persian, Of God the Bestower of Blessings, and the other, Victory and Conquest are from the Almighty. These were carved in commemoration of a victory after the War of 1780. The following is a translation of an inscription on the stone found at Seringapatam, which was situated in a conspicuous place in the fort. O Almighty God, dispose the whole body of Kafirs infidels. Scatter their tribe, cause their feet to stagger. Overthrow their councils, change their state, destroy their very root. Cause death to be near them, cut off from them the means of sustenance. Shorten their days. Be their bodies the constant object of their cares i.e., infest them with diseases, deprive their eyes of sight, make black their faces i.e., bring shame, destroy in them organs of speech. Slay them as slay them as shadow i.e., the prince who presumptuously aimed at establishing a paradise for himself and was slain by command of God, drown them as Pharaoh was drowned, and visit them with the severity of the wrath. O Avenger! O Universal Father! I am depressed and overpowered, grant me thy assistance." The Mysore Gazetteer states that this inscription should have been engraved after the Cornwallis Treaty, stating it showed his inveterate rancor and determined hostility to the English. <laughs> Relations with Christians Tipu is considered to be anti-Christian by several historians. While Alan Machado in his book Slaves of Sultans, argues that by expelling Christian priests, Tipu was only following precedent set by European rivals. Historian J. B. Prashant Moore in his paper Tipu Sultan and the Christians argues that Tipu's encounters and dealings with the Christians of both European and Indian origin were in accordance with the spirit of his times and also had a political dimension. The captivity of Mangalorean Catholics at Seringapatam, which began on 24 February 1784 and ended on 4 May 1799, remains the most disconsolate memory in their history. The Barkor manuscript reports him as having said, All Muslims should unite together, and considering the annihilation of infidels as a sacred duty, labor to the utmost of their power, to accomplish that subject. Soon after the Treaty of Mangalore in 1784, Tipu gained control of Kanara. He issued orders to seize the Christians in Kanara, confiscate their estates, and deport them to Seringapatam, the capital of his empire, through the Jamalabad fort route. However, there were no priests among the captives. Together with Freeview. Miranda, all the 21 arrested priests were issued orders of expulsion to Goa, fined rupees 200,000, and threatened death by hanging if they ever returned. Tipu ordered the destruction of 27 Catholic churches. Among them included the Church of Nosa Senora de Rosario Milagres at Mangalore, F. R. Miranda's Seminary at Monte Mariano, Church of Jesu Marie Jose at Amzor, Chapel at Bolar, Church of Mercies at Ulal, Immaculata Conceição at Mulki, San Jose at Purur, Nosa Senora dos Remedios at Kirim, São Lawrence at Carcal, Rosario at Barker, Immaculata Conceição at Badener. 
All were razed to the ground, with the exception of the Church of Holy Cross at Hospit, owing to the friendly offices of the Chowda Raja of Mudbidri. According to Thomas Munro, a Scottish soldier and the first collector of Kanara, around 60,000 people, nearly 92% of the entire Mangalorean Catholic community, were captured, only 7,000 escaped. Francis Buchanan gives the numbers as 70,000 captured, from a population of 80,000, with 10,000 escaping. They were forced to climb nearly 4,000 feet 1, meters through the jungles of the Western Ghat mountain ranges. It was 210 miles 340 kilometers from Mangalore to Seringapatam, and the journey took six weeks. According to British government records, 20,000 of them died on the march to Seringapatam. James Scurry, a British officer, who was held captive along with Mangalorean Catholics, said that 30,000 of them were forcibly converted to Islam. The young women and girls were forcibly made wives of the Muslims living there. The young men who offered resistance were disfigured by cutting their noses, upper lips, and ears. According to Mr. Silva of Gangolam, a survivor of the captivity, if a person who had escaped from Seringapatam was found, the punishment under the orders of Tipu was the cutting off of the ears, nose, the feet and one hand. Gazetteer of South India describes Tipu Sultan forcibly circumcising 30,000 West Coast Christians and deporting them to Mysore. Tipu's persecution of Christians even extended to captured British soldiers. For instance, there were a significant number of forced conversions of British captives between 1780 and 1784. Following their disastrous defeat at the 1780 Battle of Palalar, 7,000 British men along with an unknown number of women were held captive by Tipu in the fortress of Seringapatnam. Of these, over 300 were circumcised and given Muslim names and clothes and several British regimental drummer boys were made to wear gagra cholas and entertain the court as nosh girls or dancing girls. After the ten-year-long captivity ended, James Scurry, one of those prisoners, recounted that he had forgotten how to sit in a chair and use a knife and fork. His English was broken and stilted, having lost all his vernacular idiom. His skin had darkened to the swarthy complexion of Negroes, and moreover, he had developed an aversion to wearing European clothes. During the surrender of the Mangalore fort, which was delivered in an armistice by the British and their subsequent withdrawal, all the mestizos and remaining non British foreigners were killed, together with 5,600 Mangalorean Catholics. Those condemned by Tipu Sultan for treachery were hanged instantly, the gibbets being weighed down by the number of bodies they carried. The Netravati River was so putrid with the stench of dying bodies, that the local residents were forced to leave their riverside homes, the Archbishop of Goa wrote in 1800. It is notoriously known in all Asia and all other parts of the globe of the oppression and sufferings experienced by the Christians in the dominion of the King of Kanara, during the usurpation of that country by Tipu Sultan from an implacable hatred he had against them who professed Christianity. Tipu Sultan's invasion of the Malabar had an adverse impact on the Syrian Malabar Nasrani community of the Malabar coast. Many churches in the Malabar and Cochin were damaged. The old Syrian Nasrani seminary at Angamali which had been the center of Catholic religious education for several centuries was razed to the ground by Tipu's soldiers. A lot of centuries old religious manuscripts were lost forever. The church was later relocated to Khatiyam where it still exists to this date. The Mor Sabor Church at Akaparambu and the Martha Mariam Church attached to the seminary were destroyed as well. Tipu's army set fire to the church at Palayor and attacked the Olor Church in 1790. Furthermore, the Arthat Church and the Ambajakad Seminary was also destroyed. Over the course of this invasion, many Syrian Malabar Nasrani were killed or forcibly converted to Islam. Most of the coconut, arecanut, pepper and cashew plantations held by the Syrian Malabar farmers were also indiscriminately destroyed by the invading army. As a result, when Tipu's army invaded Guruvayur and adjacent areas, the Syrian Christian community fled Calicut and small towns like Arthat to new centers like Kunamkulam, Chalakudi, Enakadu, Chepadu, Kaninkode, Mavalakara, etc. where there were already Christians. They were given refuge by Sakthan Tamboran, the ruler of Cochin and Karthika Tirunal, the ruler of Travancore, who gave them lands, plantations and encouraged their businesses. Colonel Macaulay, the British resident of Travancore also helped them. <laughs> <laughs> Treatment of prisoners According to historian Professor Sheikh Ali, Tipu 
took his stand on the bedrock of humanity, regarding all his subjects as equal citizen to live in peace, harmony and concord." However, during the storming of Srirangapatna by the British in 1799, 13 murdered British prisoners were discovered, killed by either having their necks broken or nails driven into their skulls. Assessment and legacy Assessments of Tipu Sultan have often been passionate and divided. Successive Indian National Congress governments have often celebrated Tipu Sultan's memory and monuments and relics of his rule while the Bharatiya Janata Party has been largely critical. School and college textbooks in India officially recognize him as a freedom fighter along with many other rulers of the 18th century who fought European powers. In 1990, a television series on him, The Sword of Tipu Sultan was directed by Bollywood actor Sanjay Khan and based on a historical novel by Bhagwan Gadwani. Tipu Sultan has been also treated as a controversial figure and criticized for his actions against Hindus, Christians, and Mapla Muslims. Family Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Haider Ali Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Abdul Khalik Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muhi Ud Din Ali Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muis Ud Din Ali Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Miraj Ud Din Ali Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muan Ud Din Ali Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muhammad Yasin Khan Sultan Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muhammad Subhan Khan Sultan (1785–27 September 1845). Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muhammad Shukrola Khan Sultan (1785–25 September 1830). Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Sarwar Ud Din Khan Sultan (1790–20 October 1833). Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muhammad Nizam Ud Din Khan Sultan 1791 October 1791. Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Muhammad Jamal Ud Din Khan Sultan 1795 13 November 1842. Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Munir Ud Din Khan Sultan 1795 December 1837. His Highness Shahzada Sir Saeed Walsharif Ghulam Muhammad Sultan Sahib, KCSI, March 1795 to the 11th of August 1872. Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Ghulam Ahmad Khan Sultan, 1796 to 11 April 1824. Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Hashmath Ali Khan Sultan, expired at birth. Tipu had several wives. One of his wives quite renowned for her beauty and intelligence was Sin Sahiba whose grandson was Sahib Sin Sultan also known as His Highness Shahzada Saeed Walsharif Ahmed Halim as Zaman Khan Sultan Sahib. Tipu Sultan's family was sent to Calcutta by the British. A descendant of one of Tipu Sultan's uncles Noor Anayat Khan was a British Special Operations Executive Agent during the Second World War, murdered in the German Dachau concentration camp in 1944. Many other descendants continue to live in Kolkata. Topic: <inaudible> Sword and Tiger. Tipu Sultan had lost his sword in a war with the Nairs of Travancore during the Battle of the Nedumkota, 1789, in which he was forced to withdraw due to the severe joint attack from Travancore army and British army. The Nair army under the leadership of Raja Kesavadas again defeated the Mysore army near Aluva. The Maharaja, Dharma Raja, gave the famous sword to the Nawab of Arcot, from whom the sword was taken away forcibly by the British after annexing Arcot and sent to London. The sword was on display at the Wallace Collection, No. 1 Manchester Square, London. Tipu was commonly known as the Tiger of Mysore and adopted this animal as the symbol Bubri, Babri, of his rule. It is said that Tipu Sultan was hunting in the forest with a French friend. He came face to face with a tiger. His gun did not work, and his dagger fell on the ground as the tiger jumped on him. 
He reached for the dagger, picked it up, and killed the tiger with it. That earned him the name, the Tiger of Mysore. He even had French engineers build a mechanical tiger for his palace. The device, known as Tipu's Tiger, is on display in the Victoria and Albert Museum, London. Not only did Tipu place relics of tigers around his palace and domain, but also had the emblem of a tiger on his banners and some arms and weapons. Sometimes this tiger was very ornate and had inscriptions within the drawing, alluding to Tipu's faith. Historian Alexander Beetson reported that, "...in his palace was found a great variety of curious swords, daggers, fusils, pistols, and blunderbusses, some were of exquisite workmanship, mounted with gold, or silver, and beautifully inlaid and ornamented with tigers' heads and stripes, or with Persian and Arabic verses." The last sword used by Tipu in his last battle, at Sri Rangapatnam, and the ring worn by him were taken by the British forces as war trophies. Till April 2004, they were kept on display at the British Museum London as gifts to the museum from Maj Gen Augustus W. H. Merrick and Nancy Dowager. At an auction in London in April 2004, Vijay Malya purchased the sword of Tipu Sultan and some other historical artifacts, and brought them back to India. In October 2013, another sword owned by Tipu Sultan and decorated with his Babri tiger stripe motif surfaced and was auctioned by Sotheby's. It was purchased for £98,500 by a telephone bidder. Tipu Janti On 10 November 2017, the government of Karnataka under the leadership of Chief Minister Sadaramaya celebrated Tipu's birth anniversary but BJP and Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh protested against this move due to the persecution of Hindus by Tipu Sultan. Lok Sabha Congress leader, Malakarjuna Karj, hit back at the RSS, asking, when they can celebrate Nathuram Godse can't we celebrate Tipu Sultan. In fiction He has a role in G. A. Henty's 1896 book The Tiger of Mysore, and is also mentioned in Henty's 1902 At the Point of the Bayonet, which deals with much the same period. In Jules Verne's Mysterious Island, Captain Nemo is described as a nephew of Tipu Sultan. Tipu Sultan's life and adventures were the central theme of a short-running South Indian television series The Adventures of Tipu Sultan, and of a more popular national television series The Sword of Tipu Sultan. Nassim Hijazi's novels Muazzam Ali and Aur Talvar Tut Gay and The Sword Broke describe Tipu Sultan's wars. Wilkie Collins's novel The Moonstone contains an account of Tipu Sultan and the fall of Srirangapatna in the prologue. In The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen by Rudolf Erich Raspe, Munchausen vanquishes Tipu near the end of the novel. Sharp's Tiger is a novel in which Napoleonic soldier Richard Sharp fights at Seringapatam, later killing Tipu Sultan. The Only King Who Died on the Battlefield, an historical novel based on truth published in 2006, was written by a U.S. Pakistani resident and a young college student Muhammad Faisal Iftikhar. The novel claims that in recent history, Tipu Sultan is the only king who died on the battlefield. Tipu Sultan appears as a great person in the video games, Sid Meier's Civilization, Revolution and Sid Meier's Civilization IV. In his historical novels on the Seringapatam captivity of Konkani Catholics by the Konkani literateur V. J. P. Saldanha, Belthangadicho Balthazar, Balthazar of Belthangadi, Devash Krupan by the Grace of God, Sardarachi Sinal, The Sign of the Knights, and Infernachi Duram, The Gates of Hell, Tipu is portrayed as cunning, haughty, hard-hearted, revengeful, yet full of self-control. Topic: <laughs> Image Gallery. See also equals equals notes. <laughs>